In this short video, we are going to go through the basics of primer design for a, a PCR method. This is known as gene splicing by overlap extension. There are two main steps involved in the gene splicing by overlap extension method. In the first, specific fragments to be joined are isolated by PCR. The ends of the amplified fragments are modified so that the two fragments overlap. In the second step, the fragments are joined using PCR. The following is an example of PCR primer design for the gene splicing by overlap extension method. In this example, we will design primers for gene knockout through insertion of an antibiotic resistance gene. Here is the DNA sequence for the genomic region under investigation. There are three coding sequences predicted. To help distinguish them, these have been highlighted in different colors. We want to, knock out the gene highlighted in yellow. It is worth noting, this gene has a ribosomal binding sequence and promoter. We will try and keep these. Looking at the DNA sequence again, the two flanking coding sequences can be seen with the gene of interest removed. The highlighted sequence in red illustrates the gene we want to insert within this region. For this example, the sequence is a canamycin resistance gene. We will also design our primers to keep a promoter sequence for the CAN gene. The promoter will be from our genomic sequence as highlighted earlier. We will now go through the design of primers for our gene knockout. To do this we need to design three primer pairs. One pair will be for our canamycin gene. The other two pairs of primers will be for regions known as homologous arms. The homologous arms have overlapping sequences. These overlapping regions allow for recombination of PCR amplified fragments later in the process. Here is a basic list of factors to consider when designing primers. Primers should be specific to the genomic region being amplified. Their sequences should be between 18 and 24 bases in length. Primers should have a GC content of between 40 and 60 percent. Their sequences should have one or two G or C bases at their ends. This is known as the GC clamp. Primers should be designed with melting temperatures of between 50 and 60 degrees centigrade. The melting temperatures of the pairs should be within around 5 degrees of each other. Additionally, primer pairs should not have complementary regions as these could form dimers. In regard to the primer pairs, one of these should anneal to the plus strand, the other should complement the minus strand. This is also known as the antisense or template strand. Looking again at our genomic sequence, this is now shown with the canamycin gene, inserted and highlighted in red. The potential primer binding site for homology ARM1 forward primer is shown. Along with the primer binding site for homology ARM1 reverse. This is shown with the overhanging sequence for the canamycin gene. The canamycin forward primer is highlighted in yellow, along with the overhanging sequence for homology ARM1 reverse. The canamycin reverse primer is now highlighted. This has an overhanging sequence homologous to homology ARM2. The homology ARM2 forward primer has an overhang matching the canamycin reverse sequence. Finally, the homology ARM2 reverse primer site can be seen highlighted. The image represents what the primers should amplify along with their overhanging sequences. Here you can see the canamycin reverse primer sequence. Along with the overhang, identical to the homology ARM2 sequence. Designing primers using online programs, there are numerous tools to choose from. These can help find suitable primer sequences within a specific genomic region. These can also check for any nonspecific binding sites in the genome overall.
NCBI Primer Blast is a well-known primer design software, there is a link to the site shown. In the website, primers can be predicted for user-submitted sequences. There are other sites available to check your primer stats. One example is shown here. This site will check primer suitability in terms of length, percent GC and self annaling properties, just to name a few. Returning back to the primers discussed earlier, here is how the final sequences would look. The homology arm one forward primer sequence. The homology arm one reverse primer sequence with canamycin overhang. For reverse primers, the reverse complement sequence needs to be taken. The primer sequence to be used for PCR is shown with RC in brackets. Here are the forward and reverse primer sequences for the canamycin gene. Both the forward and reverse primers have overhanging sequences for joining with the homology arms. Finally, here are the forward and reverse primer sequences for homology arm 2. Only the forward primer has an overhang for joining with the canamycin gene. With luck, these three primer pairs will first yield three PCR products, which will be subject to further rounds of PCR, to give a final, single sequence which can be integrated back into our genome under investigation. Now we will look at PCR and transformation of the construct. This part covers what happened following the primer designs. The outcomes of the PCR and transformations are detailed. Here are the expected PCR product sizes. Homology arm 1 Homology arm 2 Ken Homology arm 1 with Ken and the final construct consisting of Ken and homology arms 1 and 2 if the PCR products are run on an agarose gel, along with a 100 base pair ladder. Specific base pair sizes are highlighted in blue. The PCR product for homology arm 1 are of the expected size. The same can be said for homology arm 2. The CAN PCR product, as well as homology arm 1 with CAN and the final construct, consisting of homology arm 1 and 2 with CAN, are also the correct size. As shown, the final product is just under 1200 base pairs in size. Transformations The PCR construct was designed with a DNA uptake sequence, this was within homology arm 2. DNA uptake sequences are needed for efficient transformation in Neisseria species. The next step involved transforming the PCR construct into the species under investigation. The following is an outline of the method used for the transformations. First, cells are suspended in a broth. A portion of the cells are then spotted onto solid media. PCR product consisting of the final construct is added to the dried spot. It is important to prepare a control spot, the control spot has no PCR product added to it. Allow the cells to grow, and, after a period of time, harvest the cells from the spots. Next, pass these cells to selective media. On this example canamycin was used. Selective media. The cells from the control and transformation spots were passed onto media containing canamycin. The control should not have canamycin resistance, resulting in no or limited growth. If the canamycin containing PCR construct has been transformed, cells containing this will grow on canamycin plates. The next step is to pick the resistant colony. This is then grown on fresh canamycin plates. From the resistant colonies, extract the genomic DNA. 
there are many kits available that make this part easy to carry out. Using the genomic DNA from the canamycin resistant growth, carry out PCR. Use the homology arm 1 forward and the homology arm 2 reverse primers for this. Run the PCR products on a 2% agarose gel. The key 100 base pair marker sizes are highlighted in blue. Here the PCR construct is shown. This is of the expected size. Here is the PCR product amplified from genomic DNA of cells that have not undergone transformation. Here is the PCR product from the genomic DNA of cells that have undergone transformation. The PCR product is the same size as the construct. This indicates the construct has been transformed into the genome of the species being investigated. The next step will involve sequencing the genome of the transformant to confirm the construct is present. Sequencing will also confirm the insert has integrated into the genome in the correct place and orientation. In this next part, I will present new sequencing data. Proving the PCR construct was successfully transformed. The data will show the, before and after, sequencing results. Highlighting the gene knockout, through, transformation of the construct into the correct genomic location. I will also show the effect of the canamycin gene insertion. This is highlighted by a significant increase in resistance to canamycin. The original, wild type strain had a resistance of around 30 mg per liter. Following transformation, Resistance to canamycin increased to over 100 mg per liter. Here you can see the wild type, as well as the transformed isolate. This plate contains canamycin at 100 mg per liter. The transformant is growing on the top half of the plate. The wild type is on the bottom. As you can see, it has not grown. This next part of the video will look at the sequence data. The following is a recap from earlier. There are three coding sequences predicted. To help distinguish them, these have been highlighted in different colors. We want to, knock out the gene highlighted in yellow. It is worth noting, this gene has a ribosomal binding sequence and promoter. We will try and keep these. Looking at the DNA sequence again, the two flanking coding sequences can be seen with the gene of interest removed. The highlighted sequence in red illustrates the gene we want to insert within this region. For this example, the sequence is a canamycin resistance gene. We will also design our primers to keep a promoter sequence for the CAN gene. The promoter will be from our genomic sequence as highlighted earlier. The previous short clip highlighted what we set out to do. To knock out a gene, by insertion of an antibiotic resistance marker. Following transformation, sequencing was carried out to confirm the PCR construct had incorporated into the genome. And to check it had incorporated in the right place, creating the knockout. Considering the circular bacterial genome. We want the canamycin resistance gene to knock out a specific other gene. Should the canamycin gene be at another genomic location, and expressed, this would not be a success. The wild type and transformed isolates were sequenced using an Illumina platform. The sequence data was then uploaded to RAST. The annotations were then downloaded from RAST, in an Excel format for quick comparisons. In our original data, a flanking gene is shown in green. The gene we want to knock out in yellow. And a downstream flanking gene in blue. In the sequence data for out parent strain, with no gene knockout. The genes are identically arranged to those in our originally sequenced isolate. A side-by-side -side comparison of the two annotations confirms this.
regarding our isolate with the gene knockout. One of the flanking genes is shown in green. The canamycin resistance gene is shown in red. The downstream flanking gene is shown in blue. While the knockout appears successful from the annotations, it is necessary to check the sequencing data manually. This is the sequence data from the parent isolate. The flanking genes are shown in green and blue. The yellow region highlights the coding sequence for the gene under investigation. This is the sequence data for the knockout mutant. The coding sequence for one of the flanking genes is shown in green. The coding sequence for the canamycin resistance gene is shown in red. The downstream flanking gene sequence is shown in blue. The increased antibiotic resistance, seen in the transformed isolate, as well as the presence of the canamycin gene, confirmed by sequencing, both indicate the knockout has been successful. Thank you for listening.